Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators, a production of KRWG Broadcasting. Your Legislators is a public service program providing our viewing audience in southern New Mexico the opportunity to hear about important legislative issues directly from their elected representatives in Santa Fe. Here's your host, Sloan Patton. Welcome to the last show of the season. It's sort of a homecoming of sorts for uh, Jeff Steinborn. He's the representative with us today. The coffee's still hot here, and uh, welcome Appreciate back it. home to Las Thank, Cruces. Thanks, Sloan. It's, it's great to be back. Yeah. yeah. Great, I'm sure. Uh, well, so first, I, I want to start off with um, a question about, um, about what happened sort of at the last minute sure. in the session. Yeah. Um, I understand that, that everything went fairly smoothly, um, yeah. you know, talking about the, the budget, but I want to read a, a quick quote from uh, Representative Easley. Uh, you know, he talked about um, the last session, quote, it was a good session. Everyone was treated fairly by the speaker until the last 30 seconds when the fix was in. There was no debate, no discussion in the bill, and that was unfortunate, he said, quote. Is that yeah. your impression of, of the way it, it ended? As it well? was very unusual, yeah. They rolled out a massive tax bill. Uh, it's kind of an amalgam of different tax bills. They rolled it out in the last, it wasn't really 30 seconds, it was about the last 15 minutes of the session. Mm -hmm. It was done on a, it wasn't done in a normal way in that, um, in a normal way that a bill comes through committee and then it's kind of expected it comes to the House. It was actually a House bill that had been amended at the Senate at the last second that had passed the House that was a completely different bill. And what normally happens when a, when a piece of legislation ends up being changed in the other chamber, in other words, it goes through your chamber, makes it over to the other chamber and then gets modified, the other chamber then has to go through what they call concurrence to approve the changes or not approve the changes that were made in the other chamber. A bill has to pass exactly the same out of both chambers before going up to the governor for signature. So because this was a, a bill that had already gone through the House, modified it in the last second, the final hours in the Senate, it then suddenly this massive tax package got cobbled together and we were asked to basically concur with a concur with a different piece of legislation that, w that had not gone through committees in the House in the final few minutes. Uh, no debate was allowed on it. The bill was barely explained. So yeah, it was very unusual and, and disheartening, hmm. to say the least. Yeah, well, and I'm sure some of that was done on purpose. I mean, the yeah. whole idea of doing it at the last minute is that yeah. you tell everybody, you give them this ultimatum, hey, vote on this or don't vote on it. Yeah. Yeah, think, I mean, you know, I've seen, uh, it's my fifth year in the legislature, mm -hmm. so I've, I've seen some seen interesting political maneuvers in that time. Uh, but I can't say, I, I ever remember a time, though, where we weren't, where the chamber wasn't given an opportunity to debate on a significant piece of legislation, or almost anything. So it, it's, um, it, was, it was unusual and disappointing. I, I'm not going to pull any punches in saying that. It's... You know, when we're talking about legislation that will impact the fiscal uh, well-being of the state of New Mexico, potential, you know, for years, uh, until we change this new law, this will be the law of the land. And I think if our country and taxpayers have learned one thing, it's that we need to be really fiscally sound in what we do and uh, think these things through big time. And we all support creating a good tax climate that will help stimulate jobs and but we also need a, a tax climate that creates a sound fiscal foundation for, for government and for our society. And so to have a major tax package like that without d any debate or real analysis is, 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 is not a way to run a government. And, uh, and granted, I'm sure there will be those out there who will say, well, they had that opportunity, but we didn't in the House. Mm -hmm. and well, so what was in the tax package that you specifically definitely disagreed with? Well, I think... I think it's probably the scale of the issues that I have concerns with. Uh, there were things in the package that I agreed with, such as requiring that big, kind of big, what they call big box stores pay mm -hmm. a fair tax rate in New Mexico equivalent to what New Mexico small businesses pay. Mm -hmm. We've been fighting for this for years. They tucked that in there. Mm -hmm. They put in something to kind of incentivize and sweeten the, the, 
the film uh, incentives that we have here mm -hmm. a little bit. Kind of benefited Albuquerque a bit, but, uh, but nonetheless could be positive. The cuts that w well dwarfed those, those aspects were a, a manufacturing tax that will benefit really just a couple companies in New Mexico called a single sales factor manufacturing tax cut. Mm -hmm. And then a corporate tax cut. Uh, those specific cuts, because of the scale of them, could run this state a uh, hundred plus or hundreds of millions of dollars um, a year and th that'll just put us that money in the hole and beyond well beyond the the revenue that they're bringing in from some of the other measures so those are some of the main components and then finally there was a piece in there which I know a lot of cities around New Mexico which will not like which is uh, what they called a hold harmless provision that resulted from the elimination of the food tax a few years ago. What does that mean? Well, cities, it was a unique idea provision at the time that where cities actually, out of a portion of the, the food tax that was collected, c cities were, cities collect a portion of all taxes, gross receipts taxes that are generated, a small piece of that. So when they eliminated the taxes on food, the, the arrangement that was made way back in the day was that the cities would continue to still collect that revenue and the state would give it to them. They called it a hold harmless. We will not hold the cities harmless for this change in tax policy. Hmm. Uh, it, kind of a political arrangement by nature, as I'm sure it sounds to folks. Uh, there's been some who for years have been wanting to get rid of that hold harmless. <clears throat> they put that in this deal that it would phase out over a number of years. Again, uh, Probably good tax policy, no question. Long term, something that needed discussion on how to do it. And again, it was just put in this package along with everything else. Mm -hmm. So this uh, package, I mean, it sounds like it has a lot of big implications for big stores, the big box retailers. Yeah. What does that mean, you know, as that sort of filters down to the everyday uh, person in Las Cruces? What does it mean for somebody who lives mm -hmm. in town and you know goes to Walmart to buy their groceries? What will it mean for them? Probably very little. Uh, the, the the bill itself is is pretty narrow. Uh, I mean that that piece of it, um, you know, these are companies that generate incredible annual revenues. Uh, these stores here in Las Cruces do incredibly well. So I I don't anticipate, you know, of course everything that a that a company has to shoulder, whether it's uh, higher taxes or whether it's increase in wage requirements, it's going to ultimately pass that on to the consumer to the extent they can. That's business. They're going to make their profit. And so, but because I, I wouldn't, I would hope that we're not going to see prices increase or anything like that. It's just not that dramatic of a change for them yeah. in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Well, I want to talk uh, about the, um, some of the outlay requests that you put sure. in. Um, and the budget has has officially been you know passed by yeah. the legislature. Now it goes to the governor, and she can decide to take a pen and cross off right. uh, you know this, cross off that, cross right. off this one. Um, of some of the outlay requests that you put in the budget, which ones are you mm -hmm. most um, most concerned about getting crossed off? Great question. I, you know I. I always worry most about vulnerable populations, mm -hmm. and w in my time in the legislature, when I've been given an opportunity to try to appropriate funding, uh, surplus funds that are available beyond our, our, our uh, safety net, I try to help out folks who are really in need. And uh, so in this funding request, I've given funding, for example, for new bus shelters here in Las Cruces. I think that's really important. I've given tried to get some funding for lighting in the historic Mesquite Day area. I've tried to give some funding to help with some of the improvements in the major park downtown in the Mesquite Day Historic District. Um, those are a couple examples of, of helping working class, poor population who really would benefit greatly. The kids would benefit greatly. Uh, Las Cruces would benefit from having these kinds of enhancements. And so I would hope we would do that. Also, we gave funding to help uh, with some HVAC needs for the judicial system right now in our courts. Believe it or not, in the summer, they're having to turn big fans on the judges and on the, on the people that are 
that are there, the juries and uh, horrible ventilation systems that have needed to be up improved for years. We all got together and helped um, request that funding. And so you know, there's another, another thing that would help those folks. So mm -hmm. hopefully the governor respects that these opportunities are for the citizens. They're not about us as legislators. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, with the bus, um, the bus shelters, I believe it was, yeah. um, I have it in here somewhere, it was around $100,000, I, I believe. Um, yeah, well, what, the total request, I don't think it, the final request ended up being quite that sum of money, but it was, yeah, yeah. between me and then I think uh, another legislator, Representative Archuleta, also put in some funding. I think it ended up being around eighty thousand mm -hmm. dollars for those for those bus shelters. Yeah, and really, that's I mean, that's a very small percentage of the yeah. overall budget. Yeah. Um, when you pick a number, you know, for for these things, do you do you try to pick a number that's small enough to where it won't get crossed off, mm. or do you, you know, have to balance out that that number where where somebody yeah. in Las Cruces might think, oh man, you only you're only giving eighty thousand yeah. dollars to the bus shelters. Where do you where do you find that balance? How did that work out with you know? Uh, it's rel it's really relative to where all the requests that have been made of you as a state representative in your district, uh, relative to the total amount of the cost of the project. So, the bus shelters are I think they cost around five thousand dollars a piece to construct. Um, my district only includes so many areas that need bus shelters. It's so it's kind of like what is the need? What is the cost? What are the other projects that need funding. Uh, also, I represent downtown, and, and in downtown we've been working on revitalizing that area for years, and we need to build a plaza to complete that area. Well, that is a huge uh, economic development potential opportunity for my district and for downtown, uh, making that an attraction, but that's a million and a half dollar project. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're weighing, well, with the amount of funding I may have, how do I try to make a difference in all of these projects? And how do I do it in a fair way? And again, one thing I've always looked at as a legislator are who are the populations that are most vulnerable in my district in making sure that I do everything I can to make a difference in those folks' lives. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I kind of approach it. As well as look at some of the other you know, infrastructure needs that exist out there and recognize that I am their representative and if, and if I can't help support that, who can? And who else can they turn to? So it's, you try to juggle that the best you can and the most judicious way you can. Mm -hmm. What are some of the details on the downtown plaza? Um, I yeah. know a lot of development has happened. Uh, Main Street opened in 2012, opened back up. Yeah. Uh, what's the plaza? Yeah, well the plaza is they're gonna use uh, a bank parking lot that's next door that they're gonna acquire and I think the bank is gonna end up at another location or, or that big parking area will. And uh, it's going to be really neat. We're going to create a plaza, a historic kind of a plaza-like exist in all many traditional New Mexico towns, uh, like we see in Mesilla. And uh, it's it's going to be, I think, a visually appealing gathering place where where the farmers market will be, I, I think, heavily involved. And again, just another piece of the redevelopment of downtown puzzle. Mm -hmm. So now, when you guys uh, talked about the plaza, did you you know think back to the '70s when when the attempt was made to to redevelop downtown yeah. with the different um, you know different structures, and, and that plan didn't work, and, and yeah. here we're seeing you know f downtown is finally sort of getting back to the way it was decades ago. Right. Yeah. 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 The whole the whole urbanization of downtowns it was it was actually part of a national movement. Mm -hmm. Towns were getting rid of their main streets. They were um, going to this whole model, uh, it, it didn't work. There's been lots of folks who have studied this here in Las Cruces who have done incredible work. We've had numerous organizations uh, starting with, uh, I think they were called Las Cruces Downtown, now they're called the Downtown Partnership, uh, Main Street, who have been working on this vision for years here in Las Cruces. Uh, Las Cruces has worked with some serious consultants who have worked on successful projects like in Albuquerque where the downtown revitalization of that area has been incredible, an incredible renaissance. I, I spent some time in Austin, Texas and they had an incredible renaissance of their downtown. And so, uh, so I think there's a lot of experience that's going into what we're trying to do here in Las Cruces. It's really a building process, you know, you have to put these pieces of the puzzle in place and ultimately create an environment downtown that people not only want to come to, but they want to live at as well. 
where you have shops that can go to. And that way we're building from the center of our town out. Uh, we're we're uh, decreasing sprawl a little bit and, uh, and really just creating better economic development within the city. So it's, I think a lot of know-how has gone into this and, and now as a state representative, repre fortunate enough to represent that area, I'm definitely trying to do all I can to support that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, it's an old rule in politics, of course, that um, it's easier to pass something for, you know, a, that, that gives something to a small number yeah. of people when you have a lot of people paying for it. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that's how the governor w was able to fit in um, some special interests. Uh, you know, like you said, it, the, the money goes to these one or two companies, but yeah. everyone's paying for it. Yeah. So if everyone only has to pay 50 cents or a dollar more, yeah. they won't feel it, but then these two companies get a lot of that money. Um, do you ever use that rule, though, mm -hmm. and leverage that to you know, some of your own interest? I mean, there have got to be things that you hope that you um, can get everyone to, pay, to pitch in just a little bit mm. to help out one or two groups, um, I know you mentioned, um, you know, less fortunate people. What are some of those yeah. groups that you hope to help? Well, I think a lot of our government works that way, right? I mean, if you think about it, every classroom that exists is being paid for by the citizens of the state of New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Talking about bus shelters, you know, a $5,000 bus shelter. Well, that funding is coming from severance tax funding. It's coming from oil and gas or, or uh, surplus tax money, a variety of sources generated from around the state of New Mexico. So I would think important, I mean, you know, it's all important. It all makes us work, makes our society works, makes us um, have better economic development, better jobs, arts, culture. Uh, to me, again, it's important to look at vulnerable populations as we do all these things. It's important to think about the future and invest in our kids, invest in education, invest in classrooms, um, investing in transportation, you know, in rural areas like ours where we have 32 colonias and really one of the poorest counties in the country, very isolated populations, investing in their ability to be able to have opportunity and, 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 and lift, our, lift uh, this state out of its persistent poverty. And so I know a few years ago there was a, there was a bill that we passed to dedicate 5% of, of the severance funds to Colonias to create a Colonia infrastructure fund. I think very important because we're able to target funding at these areas of persistent poverty. So I, it's not all about poverty, and I know I've said that word a lot this morning on your show, but if we're talking about what we can do to move this state forward, we have to ask ourselves, well, what are some of the things that have held this state back? And, and uh, certainly persistent poverty, high dropout rates. Mm -hmm. These are things that, that, that affect the kinds of companies we can recruit here. Uh, whether or not people at this great university choose to stay here after they graduate, or do they move to a, to a different type of economy like in Austin, or, or uh, Silicon Valley, or Denver. You know, we wanna keep them here. And so, so we need to attack the areas where we're most vulnerable where we're weakest, where we've had these persistent problems. And in that sense, it's, it's not only a, kind of a humanity problem, it's an economic development challenge as well. And that's the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. Is it a hard balance to, um, you know, to balance the constituents of yours that are um, you know, on the lower end of the spectrum and then the higher end of the spectrum? Because yeah. like you said, Las Cruces, there's a big gap here. I mean, we have here at the university, there are a lot of professors that get paid well, or doctors and lawyers. Um, right, right in this area, and then you could walk down the road a few blocks, and there, are, um, you know, trailer parks and, and yeah. several families living yeah. in, in in homes. How do you balance those constituents? Just in the way I, I described earlier, you know, as a legislator, when you pass laws, and when you um, are voting on budgets, when you're in an opportunity to appropriate a little bit of funding you should always be mindful of those that are most vulnerable and the needs of your community. Um, I used to represent, a, when I was a representative before of District 37, I represented uh, the Roadrunner area of Las Cruces, kind of the new shiny, uh, you know, very, um, you know, what am I trying to say, more affluent part of town. Mm -hmm. And I also represented the village of Doniana, 
and radium springs and areas with that, that are technically, in some cases, uh, designated as colonias mm. and uh, where, you, where you have uh, cesspools, literally, that exist in some areas. My approach was to always say, okay, well, who really needs the assistance here? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, what, what could you possibly do for an area that has a perfectly brand new street, perfect park? Uh, I mean, there are needs there, certainly uh, some of the best performing schools. Or do you really look at this area where kids are playing on the dirt field? Uh, where there's a highway, where there's a state road running through town and no walk path to even be able to safely uh, get around. And so what I did in that situation was I tried to target the poor area mm -hmm. and, you know, and then offer whatever little assistance was needed in, in the other area. So you just balance it out. And again, it's not just about, you know, poverty, but it's about targeting areas of opportunity as well. and, and uh, it's just it just depends upon what you're presented with, but I I try to look at that those that really have some basic human needs and try to bring a little just a little relief there when I can. Mm -hmm. And that's a basic democratic ideal, you know. Yeah. Th all Democrats, I mean, that's the the strong point of of the party is that um, it's about helping the poor, the less fortunate. And Republicans on the other side always say. That it's um, that it's not going to help because it's a handout. Yeah. What do you say in response to that? I I I disagree with that. I mean, I think there's lots of distribution of tax funding in our society. Uh, these might be some of the same people who are saying we should allow Intel to play a lower tax rate than Coas Bookstore in downtown Las Cruces or some other local business. Uh, mm -hmm. These are the same people that would say that. Walmart should be paying at a lower tax rate because of, because they have great lobbyists than again one of our other small businesses, uh, Napolitas, uh, you know, restaurant or gallery in, de in the Mesquite Historic District. So I, I fundamentally d disagree with that. You know, I, I think that um, part of what makes us human and part of what makes us America is that we we believe in a broad base of opportunity here in this country. And the fact of the matter is when we help those amongst us who are least fortunate, who, who maybe do have less opportunity, when we help people get educations and we help them with some basic opportunity, then guess what? They start doing better. That ultimately results in people paying more taxes because they're earning more income. Maybe they're graduating. Maybe their kids are then graduating. And you have the seeds of an economic renaissance. So. So in fact, it's just better policy, in my opinion. You look at things like the minimum wage, it's better policy to have a broader base of people doing well, to support everyone, including those at the top. If you ignore the, the people at the bottom and say, let them eat cake, you know, and you just target uh, wealth, it just doesn't work. I think we've heard about trickle-down economics, and it has not worked. We have not seen it work. We've had presidents try to put it in effect. Um, doesn't work. So in our state where we do have so much poverty, that is a fact. We have probably the highest per capita number of minimum wage earners in the country. Uh, we need to pay attention to this, you know, where we have a high dropout rate. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, and um, I mean, everyone wants economic uh, development. The economy has been on the minds of everyone for the last four years, especially. And But some people say um, that, you know, minimum wage, for example, that's not necessarily going to help people, or the minimum wage wasn't designed for to be a living wage. Um, you know, most people put the living wage at around like ten fifty. Yeah. Um, minimum wage is much lower than that, but they say that it wasn't designed for that. It was designed to give people and get people in the door, and then so they can make their own opportunities by working their way. It's just factually incorrect. With all due respect, uh, the minimum wage was created as a tool to help lift people out of poverty, uh, the working poor. Mm -hmm. And in fact, statistically, most people who make the minimum wage are over the age of 40. They have kids. This notion that, and we always hear the example, it's just about college kids coming out of college, you know? That is just, yes, there is a group of people who no doubt are being brought into the workforce. And, but the reality is, is that the minimum wage was put into effect a long time ago to help lift people out of poverty. 
it, you're right. It's not in today's e economics. The value of that minimum wage has gone down greatly from where it used to be when it was first put into effect. It no longer really is a living wage, and that is a different concept, as you point out, right. and something to be evaluated on its own terms. But it is a tool to lift people out of poverty, and the tool is just as viable today as it was when it was put into effect. And over time, as the cost of living goes up and everything goes up, to the extent that we still value the concept, the minimum wage has to go up over time. Otherwise, it's, it's really meaningless. And, and there are people who are stuck who have no other opportunity than to work for jobs that do that. And, and, and by the way, guess what? They'll have no choice but to also be taking government assistance because they can't feed themselves. They can't provide any health care for their family. They're not being provided by an employer, potentially. So what do they do? So, it's, so the minimum wage has a real role there, and the reality is to, it does help them to say that, I don't know, does a paycheck help you? I know a paycheck helps me, so why wouldn't a paycheck help them? Of course it helps them, except with them, because they have a lot lower rates of savings, they also put that money right back into the economy. Right. So in fact, what they have found is that for every dollar of the minimum wage, it has a very stimulative effect on our economy. Yeah. As opposed to a tax cut. Well, and just so, um, as as we get close to yeah. um, to the time here, do you think? Um, I mean, should should with state increases? Um, I guess we we are getting pretty close to the end of time. But um, as the uh, you know there was a one percent um, pay increase for state workers. Sure. Do you think that that should be more to keep up with inflation? It or? should be as generous as we can to honor the work of our public employees. I'm glad they got something. One percent is pretty minuscule. Uh, but I'm glad they got something, and, and uh, again, you know, people have to evaluate whether or not it's fair to give them a 1% increase while we're giving, you know, massive tax cuts out there, and that kind of takes our conversation full circle to where it started. Yeah. And that's the job of our, of our government. Yeah. Well, it's always a challenge, and uh, there's, there's never enough money, it seems like, to pass around. But um, thanks again for joining us today, and, and welcome Thank back you. home. Thanks, uh, and, uh, and thanks to you as well um, for joining us uh, for these last few weeks. Uh, we will see you again next session.